Hey guys, it's Faye from Solar Flow and I am back with another video. Today's topic is a deep dive behind the veil energy read on none other than the iconic blonde bombshell Marilyn Monroe. So if this sounds like an interesting topic to you, stick around and if not, I'll catch you at another video. So interestingly enough, if you think about who is the most well-known, famous and iconic blonde bombshell of all time, chances are you're going to be thinking about Marilyn Monroe. And that is not an accident. That was by design. And just like your association of thinking about blonde bombshell, Marilyn Monroe is not an accident. Her passing at a young age was also no accident. That was to assure and guarantee the association of her forever being memorialized as the blonde bombshell, Marilyn Monroe. Let's get into it. So, Marilyn Monroe. She had a split personality. The reason that she had a split personality was because um, she was a young girl who was in an orphanage. And there were some mental health issues with her mother and that is why she was actually in the orphanage. And when I connected to her energy, I sensed a deep sadness all around her. Every time I connected to her energy as um, the original person that she was, Norma Jean Baker, there was a deep sense of sadness all around her. And the sadness was first of all associated with the fact that she um, was in an orphanage where she was not well taken care of. She was not well loved. Um, and also it was this longing or a sense of longing in not having been raised by her mother and not having had been, um, n not having had the experience of being loved by her mother. So very much she felt that loss and that mourning. And because of that, because there was this deep sense of sadness all around her and this sense of longing and lack for the love that she did not have, plus a very, very real fear that just like her mother ended up, um, I think in a in, in mental institution because there was some mental health concerns, um, Meryl, uh, Norma Jean Baker very much was concerned and scared that the same thing was going to happen to her. Because of that, she had very easily exploitable chinks in her energetic armor. Um, and we've talked about this before. Trauma can create chinks in our armor. And for anybody that is adept at connecting to and reading energy, but not, um, not for the divine, not with good intention, but for nefarious purposes, they can, um, like a dog can smell fear, they can smell that, so to say, on a person they can see what the chinks in their armor are, and then they can very easily manipulate that person and exploit them. And that's very much what happened to Norma Jean Baker. So because she had these large gaping energetic chinks in her armor, I'm gonna even say they were like compar comparable to like the size of the Grand Canyon, like no joke. She was a very wounded young woman and a very wounded soul. And because of that, she was very easy to um, exploit because she really had modest goals and modest needs. She just wanted to make sure she was not gonna end up like her mom. She wanted to make sure that she was going to belong and have a sense of belonging. And she also wanted to make sure that she was not gonna end up like in a vulnerable state in an orphanage again. So very easy to see the energetic chinks in her armor. And she was approached and promised, we're gonna make you a star, but more than that. Because again, if anyone is not on the divine, um, they can know what to say to somebody to exploit them. So it wasn't just enough to say that she was gonna be a star. It was, we're gonna take care of you. You're gonna have a sense of belonging because you know, with the other actors, it's a close knit community. There's not a lot of us. We all look after each other. We all take care of each other. And because you're gonna be one of our assets, we wanna make sure that you're gonna be okay. So we're gonna take you to doctor's appointments just to make sure that you're gonna be on the up and up and what happened to your mom is not gonna to happen to you. And 
for a young girl, that was exactly what she needed to hear and that was exactly what she needed to know. That she was going to belong, she was gonna have a, a safe space where she was going to belong, where she was gonna be in a, like a community and she was gonna be taken care of and her mental health was gonna be taken care of. But here's the thing, that's not exactly what happened. What actually happened is she was a very pliable young woman who thought she was being taken care of. And instead, when she was going to these doctor visits to check in on her mental health and make sure everything was on the up and up, they were actually, they were having a grand old time with her brain. And what I mean by that is, if anybody has heard of uh, something called MK Ultra, they were doing MK Ultra mind control testing on her. She was the original test case for Hollywood starlets. And she was a perfect test case for a number of reasons. Number one, she was an orphan. So if they messed it up and they scrambled her brains too much and they did too much irrevocable damage, no harm, no foul. No one was going to come looking for her. The second reason is, um, and at least I don't know at what point it switched over, but back then, I would say about 80 to 100 years ago, the way that it worked in Hollywood was you were not necessarily, you didn't, maybe you had agents, maybe you didn't have agents, but you were um, signing to commit to doing a certain number of films with a film studio. So let's say in her case, I'm just making this up, let's say she had like a film commitment, she was gonna do four films, with Paramount Studios or MGM Studios. It's not like today where you have representation and you're signed with them and they like negotiate the best contracts for different films with directors or whatever. No, it was where the actor or actress had actually a contract to do a set number of films with any particular studio that they were signed to. And then when their contract expired, they could renegotiate for maybe more favorable terms or more money, or they could actually switch to a different studio altogether. So while she was, yes, working, and she was, yes, given money, the main profits were actually withheld and they were held by the studio because she had very modest expectations or very modest um, ideas of what she needed or what she thought she needed, right? She just didn't want to go back to an orphanage. Anything that was not an orphanage would be a vast improvement for her. So she had whatever, I think she lived like in a duplex or something. I'm sure at that time it was considered good money, but the majority of the money was actually withheld and the studio was making money hand over fist on her. So she was the first um, test case for Hollywood of this MK Ultra mind control. Now, for anyone who's curious about what MK Ultra mind control actually is, and I've kind of touched upon this here and there in other videos as well, this idea of what mind control is, and that there's some level of mind control that we're all kind of on on some level. The CIA actually has admitted that they um, did MK Ultra mind control back in the 1970s. And interestingly enough, they also never said that it stopped. Just leaving it out there, right? Just something for you guys to think about. I like to give you guys things to think about. I'm not necessarily gonna like spoon feed everything, but just, you know, something there for you to think about, okay? Now, interestingly enough also, um, as we've kind of talked about before, that according to the um, Cabal's laws of karma, they have to, according to their laws, they have to tell you what they're doing. And that way that it assuages them of any guilt or any negative blowback that could come their way because, hey, we told you. It's not our fault if you either weren't paying attention or you were asleep or you just thought it was a fictional movie. We've been telling you all along. It's not on us that you're not paying attention. And that even applies to Marilyn Monroe. And here's why. So she, as she was originally, was a young 
um, and plain but beautiful but plain looking young woman by the name of Norma Jean Baker. Then she was transformed, but I would say it's even more than transformed. She was metamorphosized. And that's a very intentional word, metamorphosized, because think about other, um, um, other in, are butterflies considered insects? Well, the caterpillar is, I don't know. But monarch butterflies, just like all butterflies, metamorphosize. They go through a complete metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Something there for you as well. But she was metamorphosized from Norma Jean Baker, sweet but plain looking young lady, to blonde bombshell Marilyn Monroe. So it's not just the name, which to me, I hear Marilyn Monroe, it just seems so like American iconic, right? Like Marilyn Monroe, like it just rolls off your tongue and it's so beautiful and like voluptuous and like, it's just, it, it evokes something in us when you hear the name Marilyn Monroe. But her physical appearance was tra met transformed and metamorphosized, metamorphosized as well. That was their tell because according to their laws of karma, they have to tell you what they are doing. So her metamorphosis, they changed her name, they changed her appearance, they changed other things as well with her. They were telling you what they were doing without telling you what they were doing. But they were very much, that was very much by design, the complete metamorphosis of Norma Jean Baker. I mean, and Norma Jean Baker is like a perfectly all American kind of name as well. Right? It maybe is not like as grand as like a Marilyn Monroe, but certainly if maybe they would have just, you know, transformed her appearance, but she would have been kept with the name Norma Jean Baker, that surely all American, she would probably do well at the box office anyway. But no, it was the complete metamorphosis of her from top to bottom that is so notable. And that's an invitation to say, hey, what else were they metamorphosizing? And what they were very much metamorphosizing was her mind and her sense of self-identity. Um, and she was used. So I wanna just be very, very clear about that. Um, she, and again, they had nefarious um, intentions and she was used. Um, she was used, first of all, as this test case, as this ke test case sample, proof of concept, can we do this MK Ultra, I don't know if it was called that back then, but can we do this MK Ultra mind control and will it work? Oh, hey, this works. So now they've split her personality. So now there was somebody named Norma Jean Baker, but now they've also added a new layer, a new identity, this woman called Marilyn Monroe. And with this new identity, didn't just come the new name and didn't just come the new appearance, but it also came like she talked different. She became like this sultry. That's very, very hard to fake because if somebody doesn't have that in them, you cannot fake that, right? If somebody's just like a simple, sweet, lovely person, they may not have that um, level to their nature where they can become very, very sultry and sexy. She didn't have it. So that was implanted into her. And once they realized, oh, hey, we can implant this, they started to implant other altars into her as well. So now there was not just the Marilyn Monroe, the actress, they also had super sultry, like sex pot Marilyn Monroe. And so she, first of all, I'm gonna use these next words very, very intentionally. She was mentally raped because once they got into her mind, and they saw, first of all, how pliable her mind was, they realized, oh, hey, great, now we can start um, implanting all of these other altars into her. So she was mentally raped. Her identity was also raped. And then what they did, once they were doing all of this, they also were implanting, um, so there was sultry actress Marilyn, there was like sex pot Marilyn, and then, hey, while we're at it, she is so beautiful and so iconic and so many men are going to want to have sex with her. If you're already in there, like scrambling somebody's brains, 
then obviously you're not team high vibe. You're not gonna have like the best intention for the person you're working a number on their brains. So people like that, very easy to cross the line and to be like, if we wanted to get somebody in a compromising situation or we wanted to get somebody into a situation where we could have dirt on them, what better person to use than this very, very beautiful woman that everyone's gonna wanna have sex with anyway. And I saw her very much like robotic where she was used. Um, and yes, for anyone who is curious, she, yes, she absolutely had an affair with JFK, but she also had an affair with, I don't know which brother, one of the brothers as well. And that was because there was an imp, uh, one of the altars and one of the splits in her personality was like this sex pot. But here's the thing. She was more robotic when she was the sex pot version of Marilyn Monroe. Um, and also very interestingly was it was very, very easy to do that to her because I saw that when she was a young woman, she was actually sexually abused. And in the time when she was Norma Jean Baker and she was being sexually abused, she actually um, would shut down and would like step out of herself. So this was a very easy implantation that they could put into her because she already had the previous trauma that was there. So they didn't have to do too much work when they were implanting that into her. But she was, when she was um, having these uh, affairs with people or put into these compromising situations was very, very robotic. I saw like basically her like walking into a room literally like just taking her dress off and like getting into bed and like having sex with somebody. That's it. Like just not, again, she really honestly wasn't even really there at those times. Um, and she actually, I was able to actually see there were also periods in her life where she felt very much like, she, and this is not necessarily the terminology she would use, but she felt like a walk-in. She felt like she was a walk-in in someone else's life. Um, and that became very, very um, prominent a little bit later on when she was married to Joe DiMaggio. We're gonna get there in a minute. Um, but I wanted to first discuss her marriage with um, Arthur Miller. So um, I think she was married to Arthur Miller first. And again, you guys know I don't, I don't research uh, timelines or anything like that. I don't wanna be like influenced. I want the information to come in pure. So I didn't actually like look like, oh, who is she married? You know me by now. At least I hope so. So um, here's, here's the way it came in when she was with Arthur Miller. So interesting. The word, the exact word that came in, she desperately, desperately, this was the word that came in. She desperately loved Arthur Miller. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Arthur Miller was a playwright um, and he, he loved her too. Um, Marilyn had a very curious um, mind and she was, um, she had a very pure, loving, genteel kind of energy and she had a very, very curious mind and he loved her curious mind. He actually delighted in the fact that he could spend time reading to her and he could talk to her about his ideas and she was just so open and warm and welcoming that she was actually a really great soundboard for him and he loved her and she desperately loved him. But here's the thing. This is somebody that had um, a lot of trauma. And the example that I'm going to give you is let's say, think about like, let's say you had a disposable bottle of water, um, bottle of water, <laughs> and you didn't realize that there was a leak in your plastic water bottle. And so you're going throughout your day carrying this water bottle around with you and you're like, I don't know what's wrong with my water bottle. There's no, I just keep filling it up and I keep losing water because you haven't yet realized that there's a leak in it. So you keep filling it up and it keeps leaking. That is kind of what trauma can do. Trauma can create chinks in our energetic armor in which we can leak, so to say, parts of ourselves out. And if we are not aware of it, and we do not do the inner work to repair it, then we can continuously leak on an ongoing basis. 
And that's very much what happened to Marilyn. So she had a lot of trauma. She had a lot of energetic chinks in her armor. Also, where she was not very much developing her own personal sense of self, um, you know, she kind of had been hijacked by the movie industry where they were, you know, doing mind games with her to make her like the perfect little blonde bombshell and perfect little like sultry actress. There was not a lot of time for her to like do personal development. And probably also I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say like that was not a thing back then, right? Like personal develop is like very much more of a thing now. But back then, this was like that generation had like lived through World War I, probably, or they had definitely like lived through World War II. So people were more in like a sense of survival. It wasn't like, oh, hey, like I need to take a personal day and like tend to my mental health. No. So that was not a thing. Like look at yourself from like even your parents' generation. Our generation is very much like all about mental health. Our parents' generation, not so much. So she was of that generation where no one's really thinking about like, oh, you know, I got a, and this is also like very new agey, like, oh, I have a chink in my energetic armor. I need to repair that shit. Or I'm just going to be leaking my energy out all over the place. And then I'm going to be like vulnerable to energy vampires. You know, like there's a very specific subset that's going to like understand that and use that terminology and it anyway, certainly not back then. Um, but so she, because she had all of this trauma, never felt like she was his equal. She, um, was very insecure and she was prone to bouts of depression because of her insecurity, because she was convinced and she was sure that he was going to leave her because she was not as smart as he was. So she very much did not see herself the way she was, and she very much did not see herself the way other people saw her either. She did not understand and did not see the way in which he loved her. And he really, really, really did love her. But at some point he realized there was no amount of loving her that he could do that was going to repair her and make her feel whole. And he realized that. And this became a self-fulfilling prophecy where she was convinced he was going to, and I don't know who left who, I don't know like the minutia and the specifics of it, but energetically understand that because she was so convinced and she was so sure that, sorry, I just kicked my tripod, that she was so convinced and so sure that he was going to leave her, energetically, that is what happened, where the marriage came to an end because he, First of all, the bouts of depression were very, very hard on him. And he was just trying to love her and love her and love her and get her to realize like, but baby, I love, I don't think he used the word baby, but I, he really loved her. Um, but she could not shake herself when she was in those bouts of depression. So unfortunately, the first time in her life where, and these were the words that came in, she did feel for the first time loved and valued and meaningful and he fulfilled her. And for the first time in her life when she actually had that and she was not being used by a movie, a movie studio where she was actually um, loved for who she was and appreciated for who she was, it did come to an end. And yes, for anyone who's curious, trauma actually can do that as well. Just saying. Okay. Um, now, then... What happens is, I think, she got into a relationship with somebody by the name of Joe DiMaggio. And Joe DiMaggio, oh, oh, here's another thing. This was a beautiful image that came in and I really wanted to share it. This is the image that I'm about to share is one of the happiest memories in her um, lifetime as Marilyn Monroe. One of her favorite things with Arthur Miller was where they would sit on the couch, they would cuddle on the couch together and he would read to her. I'm looking at my sofa, but just in case you're wondering where I'm looking right now. But so like I saw them where she is sitting on the sofa, leaning back into him and her toes are tucked in between, you know, like if you have a gap in the cushions, she would tuck her toes under the cushion next to the cushion that she was sitting on, leaning into him. She would have her head like on his chest or on his shoulder he would have one of his arms wrapped around her. His other arm was holding a book 
and then her arms were like holding his arm into her. This was one of the happiest. It left such an indelible impression on her that it came through super, super clearly, just like that, where I could see like all of the details and all of the like, like the last little thing, like the most notable thing was her like tucking her toes like under the cushions of the cushion next to her. The best, like that's the best memory she has is Marilyn Monroe. It wasn't like being an actress. It wasn't like the fame, the fortune, the iconic moment where she's wearing a white dress, standing on a grate and a wind blows up and then none of that. Her favorite memory as Marilyn Monroe was cuddling with Arthur Miller on the sofa, tucking her toes under the cushion and he's reading to her. It's beautiful. Now we're gonna take that and we're gonna say, <laughs> that was with someone who loved her genuinely for who she was and genuinely appreciated her for who she was. Her um, marriage to Joe, Joe DiMaggio was very much the polar opposite. So first of all, he really frankly did not care about her curious mind or her sweet nature or her, he didn't care about that. She was a status symbol and she was the best, brightest, prettiest status symbol that he could get. He had a very, very different nature. He was not like a genteel soul like Arthur Miller was, which is why she was more of an energetic match with Arthur Miller. But she was already here. You're taking a wounded soul and you're compounding the wounds. So it's leaving her susceptible to somebody like a Joe DiMaggio. Now, here's also the thing. For anybody that is like a Joe DiMaggio, whether they're aware that they're, they have toxic traits or not, they at least understand that they can't come into someone's life and be like, oh, hey, you're pretty. You're going to be with me because you're the biggest status symbol I can get my hands on. No, that shit doesn't work. So he knew on a subconscious level that he had to come in and he had to wine her and dine her and tell her she was beautiful and he loved her and, oh, he's going to take care of her and all of these things. In actuality, he did not see her for who she was. So when elements of her personality started to come out and it was not in alignment with this fabrication of what he imagined Marilyn Monroe to be, it enraged him because suddenly this new shiny toy that he, he just bought isn't working the way that he thought it was. That's not the way the store salesman told me this was going to work. So this enraged him because he had built up this fabrication in his mind of what Marilyn Monroe was like, not actually taking the time to get to know her because he didn't actually care about her. He cared about the image of her and the status symbol of her. So when she actually became a real human being with real actual wants, needs, goals, desires, dreams, needing to be comforted at the end of the day, my toy is not working. He had a temper. Um, he, act, he, actually, he had a really, really bad temper actually. Um, and he would, uh, I don't know if I can say this, but he would physically do things like this to her. They had a very, very tumultuous, very, very unhappy relationship because there was a lot of this stuff going on to her. Um, because again, he was enraged, my toy's not working because he didn't actually care about who she was as a person. Now, so we're taking trauma. This is someone who has endured terrible trauma in their youth. We're compounding the trauma that they have endured in their youth with scrambling of their brain by people with not good intentions. Then she has had her heart broken by the one person that she loved that she was genuinely loved back by. So it's a co compounding of all of the trauma that she had endured. And there were periods, she was very, very shut down when she was married to Joe DiMaggio very shut down and there were periods in her life where she actually um felt like life was happening around her but not to her she actually didn't feel like she was in her life and this is not the word that she would use but she felt like she was a walk-in in her own life so she felt less and less like um norma jean baker and when she was actually Norma Jean Baker in her body, she felt like she was um, invading somebody else's life. She felt like she was invading Marilyn Monroe's life. And this started to 
um, have very, very negative consequences. First of all, in her, her, her professional life, she was having problems on set. She was um, not really motivated. She was really, really very, very, very shut down. Um, and it was starting to take a very huge energetic toll on her. Now, when all of this started to happen, um, and they actually realized, um, okay, proof of concept, this works. So we know, here's our test dummy. We proved the concept that we can create an altar not just one altar in one person, but we can create multiple altars in one person. She's becoming, you know, a problem on set. Um, she's becoming unprofessional. She's unmotivated. It's going to sound horrible, but the thought kind of was like, well, what do we even need her for anyway? So a decision was made because they were also looking into the future and they were like, well, hold on a second. We know that this works. We've you know, proof of concept, this works. So for future generations with all of the other young starlets that are on the way in, that if they want to be like a, a, a Hollywood starlet and they want to be like a blonde bombshell, brilliant. The best way to memorialize her in people's minds is for her to die young. So just like she was a tool throughout all of her career and they didn't see her as a person at any of those particular points she was yet again at this time seen as a tool and not seen as a not seen as a person who was in a crisis who was in an unhappy marriage who was in a a tailspin and in in a, a, an identity crisis and a mental crisis an emotional crisis so instead of seeing her as a person who was in need they were just like, well, she's too much trouble. Let's just put her down. Like very much the same way if somebody had a horse and the horse broke their leg and they're like, oh, well, the, ho well, the horse is just never going to be the same. Let's just, you know, let's just put the horse down. This is a person. And they didn't see her as a person. They saw her as a tool. And they very much understood she was becoming too unruly. She was becoming too much of a problem it's okay, we'll cut our losses. She's going to just be memorialized in people's minds forever and ever and ever. We already know that this works. Let's just cut our losses, right? And then for all future generations, we're gonna use her as the gold standard. She is like the A-list gold standard of a Hollywood bombshell. And um, I didn't spend too much time actually looking at her death. Um, but I will tell you what I did see when I looked into it. So yes, on the night that she um, died, um, I saw two, I think three, I saw two um, men from, I guess like the Hollywood studio, I don't know. And then I saw there was also a doctor there. Um, and I saw the two men were kind of like standing off to the side and I saw the doctor holding, I think he injected her with something. Um, and I saw hit the doctor holding her hand and holding her wrist and he was checking her pulse until her pulse stopped and he put, then he put her hand on and then he said, it's done. So she was, she was taken out. I mean, for anyone who needed like the confirmation, it was not like an accidental death. She was definitely taken out. Um, and what I saw and I wanted to also kind of see like what happened to her afterwards. Like she, has she come back? What was it like when she crossed over? Was she sad? Was there grief? Was there mourning? Um, she was a bit confused. Um, she really didn't know where she was. It was a bit, it was a bit, it was, it was a little, it was actually a little bit scary for her. Um, because it was just so unexpected. She wasn't like expecting it. So she was suddenly crossed over and it was like, what's going on? Where am I? Um, but very, very interestingly enough, she never, she has not come back. She has not incarnated again. She is still on the other side. She hardly ever looks back in this direction. She hardly ever looks back at the life that she had here. She's actually created a meaningful life for herself on the other side. And this is what I actually saw. Um, so she is still on the other side and she is helping other young women 
vulnerable young women right at the point when they they cross over so even if they don't know like who marilyn monroe is right it could be just like a young girl who was also from a orphanage or it could be a young girl who didn't have any family and didn't have any anywhere to go or was a runaway and ended up on the streets maybe with like a pimp maybe she was a prostitute or she had drug problems or whatever the case is she is the point of contact for any young vulnerable woman just like she had been a young vulnerable woman um that don't have family that when they cross over she is there and she has um built like a beautiful life for herself on the other side actually because not only is she doing something that is where she feels there is value and meaning in it but she is She's like her own little girl gang on the other side. And she is having the opportunity on the other side to first of all be, to experience being a mother because she didn't have that experience on this side. So she's having what she never had. She's getting to be a mother to other young girls when she didn't have a chance to be a mother. And she's also getting the experience, in a way she's mothering herself in the process of mothering these young girls as well and really have has repaired her soul and repaired herself through this process of being that loving warm nurturing soul right on the other side when a soul crosses over and she is like a little girl gang a little gaggle of these young young beautiful little souls um that were vulnerable and crossed over really far too young but she has them and she's taking really, really good care of them on the other side. So um, for anyone who, you know, is curious about that, she's really, she's, she's again, more than just okay. She is, it's the first time in her, and it's funny to say in the first time in her life, because she's not like, she's not like alive, like the three dimensional terms of what it means to be alive. But she is, um, has found meaning and purpose in what she does now, much more than in any meaning and purpose that she had ever found as Marilyn Monroe. So when she like looks back here, and the, the it's really funny the way it's actually coming in right now. So if you know that song, I don't know who sings it. Um, now, you're, now you're just somebody that I used to know. Very much now, <laughs> When she looks back at Marilyn Monroe, that's just somebody that she used to know, but it's not her because the real her is being a mother to all of these little young souls crossing over onto the other side. So as always, guys, I hope that you have enjoyed this video, maybe found it to be thought provoking, insightful, enjoyable, whatever it's been for you. Take what resonates and leave the rest behind. And as always, until next time, Stay in the high vibration.